Look at this picture. What do you see? At first glance, you might see a perfect family photo, a well-groomed man and a beautiful child. But take a closer look into the eyes of the man. See the intense stare. See how his lips are twisted into a grimace. These are the eyes of a pathological liar, murderer, and rapist. See how sad the girl is. This isn't his daughter. This girl has been molested by the man since she was four. This is America. The America you thought only existed in horror movies or yellow press. Alas, this is more mundane than you'd want to believe. Flash forward, 1985, Atlanta, Georgia. Meet Sharon Marshall and her dad, Warren Marshall. At 15, Sharon was an exemplary student. She was diligent and kind. She read a lot and dreamed of a career in aerospace engineering. Sharon didn't have it easy. Every day she went home from school at 4.30 p.m. sharp. Sharon had to get the dinner ready for her father. Warren Marshall was odd. He told everybody that Sharon's mother had died in a car accident. Then he changed his tune. At a school meeting, he told that she died from cancer. Memory tricks? That wasn't the only strange thing about Warren. When his daughter Sharon met Jennifer Fisher, she refused to give her new friend her phone number. Instead, Sharon frequently called Jennifer herself. Their friendship was growing. When Jennifer didn't receive a single phone call in two weeks, she got worried. She conducted a small investigation and called Sharon herself. Sharon was spooked out of her mind. She demanded to know how Jennifer got a hold of her number. Sharon's father grabbed the receiver and the call was cut short. The next day, Sharon called back. Warren joined the conversation and apologized for his strange behavior. He even allowed Sharon to go for a sleepover at the Fisher's house. The girls were enjoying school, enjoying their friendship. Everything seemed to be looking good. Everything except for the presence of Warren Marshall. One night, he brought Sharon to the Fisher's place and struck a conversation with the girl's parents. First, he inquired if any of their acquaintances were hiring. Next, he asked for their recommendations. In the end, a total stranger, he asked them for money. Warren was an unpleasant individual, all right. Despite disliking him, Jennifer's parents let their daughter spend a night at Marshall's. Their place proved to be a trailer, with bedsheets serving as room partitions. Warren offered the girls to take them out to dances. Jennifer decided to change into something flashier. Sharon was only happy to share her wardrobe with her. To her friend's surprise, Sharon had a lot of skimpy-looking clothes and suggestive underwear. They arrived at a biker club full of older males. Minors weren't allowed. But Warren smoothed things over. The girls danced the night away. Later, when at home, the girls started joking about the hungry looks they were getting from all those men. Warren fumed, grabbed a gun, pointing it at the scared girls, lecturing them about respecting the elders. Despite having such a weirdo as a father, Sharon graduated from high school with flying colors. She earned a full scholarship to the Georgia Institute of Technology to study aerospace engineering. Her dream to work for NASA was about to come true. In 1986, Sharon started dating Curtis Flurney, a fellow student. Pregnant with his child, she decides to run away from her abusive father. They got as far away as Alabama when Warren caught up with them. He was uncharacteristically calm and said that they'd discuss everything in the morning. Curtis discovered a note that said Sharon wasn't pregnant with Curtis's child and that he'd better leave her alone. Soon, Sharon and Warren Marshall moved to Arizona. Sharon continued to keep in touch with Jennifer. She told her that she was working at a bar in Tampa, Florida. Jennifer was quite shocked to learn that she had enlarged her breasts. In 1988, Sharon confessed to Jennifer she had given birth to a boy. She named him Michael. And then she stopped calling. 
Enter Tanya Dawn Hughes and her abusive husband, Clarence. Tanya worked as a strip dancer, a hard-working girl with a small kid named Michael, and a grumpy husband to boot, an odd, easily irritable guy who claimed he was 40 but looked more like 50-plus. In fact, the husband wasn't just grumpy. Tanya came to work bruised if she hadn't earned more than $200 the night before. She rarely took a day off while her husband stayed at home. He claimed he had a bad back, and there was a two-year-old son to take care of too. Claren often phoned in to see if Tanya was at work. He wouldn't let her out of her sight. More than that, Clarence threatened to kill both her and her son if she left him. Tanya didn't dare try, as Clarence was friends with local police officers. He could find her anywhere. To satisfy the insatiable greed of her husband, Tanya falsely declared her income to collect welfare checks. While on a boating trip with Hugh Hess, a friend of Tanya's, a fellow dancer, Cheryl Ann Camesso, got into an argument with Clarence. Allegedly, Cheryl was so outraged by the man, she reported Tanya's scheme to the social services. No more welfare checks for Clarence. Enraged, Clarence rushed to the club, got into a fight with Camesso, and punched her in the face in front of her co-workers. Shortly after, Camesso left her home. She told her father she was going to visit a friend. The man got alarmed that his daughter didn't phone in upon arrival and called the police. Her car was found parked at a local airport. Camesso vanished without a trace. Despite Clarence's threats, by April 1990, Tanya decided she had enough of the nasty old man and his abusive antics. After all, she'd met a young man named Kevin Brown, who truly wanted to care for her and her son. He was a college student she'd been having a secret affair with. Alas, it wasn't meant to be. Late at night, Tanya was found on the side of a highway. Groceries were strewn about her. She was heavily bruised, but alive. The poor woman was rushed to the Oklahoma City Hospital. Daddy, daddy, she moaned and called out. In the morning, her husband Clarence came to see her. He claimed he was asleep at the time of the accident. Red paint was found at the crime scene. Clarence Hughes owned a blue Oldsmobile 88 and was crossed out as a suspect. Even then, Clarence was strangely possessive. When Tanya's friends came to visit her, he demanded an explanation for their presence. He wouldn't allow them to see his wife. Tanya was unconscious the whole time. She had a large hematoma at the vertex of her head. Still, her condition seemed to improve. The hit-and-run victim was going to pull through, after all. Only she didn't. Clarence continued visiting her. He brought their son, Michael, with him. The kid cried all the time and strongly smelled of urine. That alarmed the medics. On top of that, Kevin Parsley, a friend of Tanya's, called the hospital, worried that Clarence might do something to his wife. The next morning, she called again, only to be told that her friend was dead. Clarence Hughes had visited her just hours before. The autopsy revealed a lot of older injuries, plastic surgeries, and signs of multiple pregnancies. Conveniently so, Mr. Hughes had his wife insured for $80,000. When he arrived to collect the money, he kept feeding the insurance company fake social security numbers until he finally produced a card with the real one. It belonged to Franklin Delano Floyd. This man had been wanted by the police for the last 20 years. Six weeks later, they finally caught up with Floyd in Augusta, Georgia. Despite being a prime suspect in the deaths of Tanya Hughes and Cheryl Camesso, Floyd was charged with only one crime dated as far back as 1973. Floyd was convicted of attempted kidnapping and sexual harassment and sentenced to 2.5 years in prison. This whole time, his son Michael was living in foster care. In fact, Floyd arranged it himself before attempting to run away with the money. 
Despite the obviously heinous nature of the man, Michael was regularly brought to visit him. Michael's foster parents noticed how reluctant the child was to see his imprisoned father. Following the adoption routine, they did a DNA check and made an interesting discovery. Michael wasn't Floyd's biological son. Upon his release in 1993, Floyd started fighting for his parental rights. I want to plead for the return of my son whom I love with all my heart. I've never harmed my son in the case that's been reversed by the Supreme Court. Citing his criminal past, the court denied his request. In 1994, claiming to be Michael's father, Floyd entered the principal's office at Indian Meridian Elementary School in Choctaw, Oklahoma. He came in, he was acting rather nervous. He said, what I'm doing is very difficult. He said, I'm ready to die. If you don't help me, you won't live either. Holding Principal Davis at gunpoint, he kidnaps both Michael and the principal. The principal was rescued hours later, but Michael's fate was not known for another 20 years. Floyd was arrested two months later while trying to obtain a driver's license. Where was Michael? Nobody but Floyd knew the answer. He was sentenced to 52 years for kidnapping. A year after Floyd's capture, the police discovered the truck he used to kidnap Michael hidden in the mechanical bowels of the car. There was an envelope stuffed with 97 photographs of the most gruesome content. Nothing but two revelations were awaiting the policemen. Many of the photos were of a woman bound, brutally beaten, and shot. The same year, skeletal remains were found in Florida. Only in 1996, it was determined that they belonged to Cheryl Ann Camesso. Investigators compared the injuries to that in the photos. It was the same person. Another portion of the photos was an underage girl photographed in suggestive positions or being sexually assaulted by Franklin Floyd. Who was the poor child? Years before, while attending the funeral of his wife Tanya, Franklin Floyd put a photograph on her coffin. This photograph. It was a telling clue, but only in 2014 did Franklin Floyd divulge Tanya's true identity. It was his daughter, Sharon. Sharon Marshall. For years, Franklin Floyd was using aliases. Warren Judson Marshall, Brandon Cleo Williams, Clarence Marcus Hughes, Trenton Davis, Preston Morgan, Kingfish Floyd. All one man. A con man. He forced Sharon, aka Tanya, into the same life of lies. But neither Sharon nor Tanya were her true names. She was born Suzanne Marie Sevakis, a daughter of one Sandy Chipman. Mrs. Chipman had been married two times and bore four children before she met Brandon Williams. They dated for a month before moving in together, a family of six. Maybe that was the family Williams, that is, Floyd, was looking for. In 1975, Chipman was sentenced to 30 days in jail, leaving his kids in the care of Floyd. When the woman was released, she came back to an empty home. Floyd disappeared, along with her kids, never to see her again. Eventually, Sandy Chipman found two of her children, Floyd left them behind in the care of a local church-operated social services group. Only in 2019, her youngest son, Philip, was identified using DNA testing. This whole time, Suzanne Sevakis was abused and tormented by Franklin Floyd. First, he made her into his daughter, then into his wife, before taking her life altogether. But what happened 
to Michael. The revelation came in 2014. For all those years, Floyd had been adamant about his statements. He claimed that Michael was alive and well. Maybe it was the long 13 years he spent on death row for the murder of Cheryl Camesso that did it. Scott Lobb, FBI Special Agent. I've been asking him, how'd you kill him? How did you kill him? How'd you kill him? And finally just turned and looked at me and said, matter of factly, I shot him twice in the back of the head to make it real quick. He didn't show any remorse. Michael's remains were never found. So why did Floyd kill the boy he claimed he loved so much? Scott Lobb believes it was because Michael and Floyd had grown apart more than Floyd ever suspected. Michael was happy with his new life and didn't want anything to do with Floyd who'd only caused him suffering. No matter how possessive, Floyd could not have the boy back. He knew it couldn't be what he wanted it to be. He knew his life wouldn't be the same because Michael didn't love him anymore, didn't want to be with him. Franklin Floyd, born into a dysfunctional family of an alcoholic, he was the youngest of the five kids. His early life was riddled with poverty, bullying, and sexual abuse. In his late teens, he found out that his mother had become a prostitute. Attempting a robbery, he was wounded in the stomach and put into a youth institution. Aged 18, he kidnapped a four-year-old girl and sexually assaulted her. Floyd was put behind bars again, but escaped and committed a robbery, only to be caught once more. Floyd attempted two more escapes from prison. He'd been repeatedly raped by the inmates. Floyd had been driven to desperation, and at one point he climbed the prison rooftop and threatened to commit suicide. After his release in 1973, he assaulted a woman at a gas station. It was that very same case that got him jailed 27 years later in 1990. That was Floyd's life up to the point of him meeting Sandy Chipman at the bus station. But would one call that a life? Maybe nightmare is a more appropriate term. When you're living in hell, can you have the strength to see beyond the scolding flames of constant suffering and molestation? Can you see another life? Can you believe a family might exist in true happiness and harmony? Suzanne Sevakis tried her hardest. Against all odds, she tried. Franklin Delano Floyd could not and would not. The monster he'd become saw no alternatives. Struggling to create a family, struggling to have someone to care for, all he did was cause grief and destruction to the people he thought he loved. To have a life like that? To have a father like Franklin Floyd? God forbid. <laughs>